The next unit up in our study of exercise physiology is unit two, which is the study of metabolism. In today's module six, what we're going to focus on is really just an intro into um, bioenergetics, otherwise known as metabolism. So the objectives and goals for um, today's module is, is three things. One, to define the role of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins in metabolism. Second, we'll identify the different forms of, of each of these um, and how they may interact uh, with metabolism uh, at rest and during exercise. And then the second video will just be um, a uh, broad overview of enzymes and how they work and how they help assist reactions to take place. So what is metabolism? So one, the, these two words will get used often uh, interchangeably. So um, I prefer metabolism, but you'll also see bioenergetics, and I know that that's uh, at least how the book starts as well. So bioenergetics is essentially just the metabolic pathways that convert energy from food into bio, um, biologically usable form. In general, when we're talking about this, this is going to be ATP, right? ATP is the general currency uh, for energy uh, in our body. So what we're really going to be talking is, is how we can take energy from the sun and convert it to ATP in our cells, right? So the broad overview is that plants are able to take sunlight through photosynthesis and create um, uh, um, be able to create um, sugars in this case. Um, these sugars can then be eaten directly by humans uh, for the vegetable lovers in the group, or they may be eaten by other types of animals, and then the uh, humans can then eat that um, meat as well. We can then take these foods that are broken down in our protein, our fat, and our carbohydrates, and we can convert those into usable molecules. Primarily what we're going to uh, break them down into is glucose and fat, but then that glucose and fat can then be essentially walked through metabolism in, uh, in a very specific set of, set of steps in order to create ATP, and then we can use that ATP um, to do things like a muscle contraction, as we learned in the uh, last lecture. So first, let's start with uh, probably the most important uh, source of energy, and that is carbohydrates. Uh, why are they so important? It is because they provide a rapid and readily available source of energy. Um, so we keep a pretty good store of um, carbohydrates in the form of glycogen. We'll focus on that here in the next um, slide. Uh, but this is what the body will uh, rapidly use to create ATP using glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. Right. In general, we can take one gram of carbohydrates, and we, and in that one gram, we can create four kilocalories of energy per gram of carbohydrates, which is a decent number. Uh, carbohydrates can be found in many different forms. So we have mono, di, and polysaccharides. Mono meaning one, di meaning two, and poly meaning many. So we'll start with the most basic. The most basic is a monosaccharide. This includes glucose. Glucose is the most important and will be uh, the main focus of this uh, talk uh, or, or um, this entire section. It is the, and that is because it is the only form that can be directly metabolized. Uh, the other two forms of monosaccharides that we get in our diet are fructose, which is fruit sugar, and galactose, which is milk sugar. So why, it, why is the study of monosaccharides important in exercise physiology? I know you may be thinking right now, I thought this was ex-phys, not intro to nutrition. So how, do, so how does knowing uh, the three different forms of monosaccharides come into play uh, in exercise physiology? So let me give you a quick example. So glucose, we know, is the only form that can be directly metabolized. So when we're talking about generating a large amount of ATP through glycolysis and aerobic metabolism, what we're going to do is use glucose um, primarily as that fuel. We have to convert fructose and galactose in our body, so those may take a little bit longer. However, what we found is that um, there is a limited amount of carbohydrates available if you are exercising long term. And so uh, it's very common for people to, um, to take some type of fluid replacement that includes some type of sugar. So I've included here uh, Gatorade as an um, 
homage to uh, my time spent at the University of Florida. Uh, as you guys know, this is a, a sweet drink. Uh, it contains sugar and it also contains electrolytes. So it's kind of A, giving you this energy for a boost the electrolytes to kind of replace the sodium and potassium lost in, in, uh, in sweat. We'll ignore that for now, but we'll really focus on the sugar content, right? Uh, this is a very sweet drink, but what researchers have found is that um, essentially there are only um, a certain amount of uh, transporters in the gut for glucose, right? So you can put all this glucose in Gatorade, you can fill it up with all this sugar, no matter how much you put in, there's only going to be a certain amount of glucose that gets in, the rest of it is just going to be washed out uh, and lost in the urine. And so what they um, found is actually using fructose and glucose, a combination of both of these sugars and Gatorade, is that we can get around that limited number of transporters of glucose because fructose uses a completely different set of transporters to get uh, sugar into the blood. We can then convert that fructose into glucose and use that. So this is kind of an interesting way of, of exercise and performance physiology and knowing the basics of carbohydrates is that glucose alone, you have a limited amount. If you use something like fruit, fructose, which has a different transporter, you can get more of both of them into the bloodstream and use those for sugars during exercise. Uh, the next is uh, disaccharides. Disaccharides are uh, two sugars put together. So we can make glucose plus glucose equals maltose or glucose plus fructose equals sucrose. Sucrose is, is table sugar um, and is very important um, as, uh, as we see it in America. So it actually makes up about 25% of the American diet, which is actually not a good thing. And then last but not least, we have polysaccharides. So polysaccharides means a grouping of three or more sugar molecules uh, together. So we have three types. Uh, the first two, starch and cellulose, are both plant-based. So we get these from eating plants. Uh, for example, starches, uh, potatoes are a very starchy vegetable. Um, and these can be broken down by the body uh, into their individual subunits and then in, into, ultimately into glucose uh, for energy. Cellulose, on the other hand, our bodies do not have the have cellulose uh, enzymes to break down uh, this content, and so it is just lost in digestion and not uh, broken down into its simple sugars. And the last but not least, as I hinted uh, next, is glycogen. So glycogen is the storage form of glucose in animals. Uh, it is most predominantly stored in two sites in the liver and the muscle. So we both have uh, relatively um, large stores compared to other cell types. So as you can see, here's a nice figure of uh, glycogen. Each little red uh, hexagon here is glucose. So as you can see, again, uh, if we think about the definition of polysaccharide, it would be three or more sugars. You can see it is this uh, um, large branching um, uh, polysaccharide with lots and lots of glucose and what we can do in times of energy need is we can um, break off each of these individual um, glucose molecules in a process called glycogenolysis which is the breaking down of glycogen into glucose and then this can enter our metabolic pathways in the opposite so in times of maybe after exercising and then you go drink a Gatorade or uh, eat a meal, when we have excess glucose, we can then take that glucose and store it up for later, and we can call that um, glycogen, um, uh, glycogenesis, which is the formation of glycogen from glucose. Again, this is to, uh, in general, replete stores that we have um, broken down. Right, so um, glycogenesis is the making, glycogenolysis is the um, breakdown. And again, these two forms are most are important for metabolism during rest and exercise and pr uh, providing kind of this relatively quick um, ATP um, production uh, metabolism. So next we'll jump into fats. Uh, fats are, uh, have the, you know, pro and con. So you'll see the top one gram of fat uh, provides nine kilocalories of uh, energy. Right. Uh, it's interesting they have the exact same chemical elements as carbohydrates, so it includes 
uh, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, um, just in different ratios. And because of this, uh, fats include very many more carbon, uh, and we can use those carbons as we'll, we'll focus through by breaking those down through a process called beta oxidation. And those produce much more uh, energy in the form of kilocalories than carbohydrates, which are uh, provide four kilocalories of energy. So these are plentiful in the human body. So these are great for, as you can imagine, long duration exercise uh, where we can then break down fat and use these huge stores um, in our body in order to uh, provide large amounts of, of ATP over a long duration time. However, the process in breaking them down is actually much slower uh, than glucose. And so uh, that's kind of the trade-off. You get more energy, but it takes a, a longer time to break them down. <coughs> uh, there are uh, two different types of, um, of fats that we will see in the body. The first is the fatty acid. This is just an even number of anywhere between 4 to 24 um, carbon atoms, so the small um, Fatty acids are going to be small chain fatty acids, relatively small. Then we have medium chain fatty acids and large chain fatty acids, which are going to have these, you know, 18 to 24 carbon atoms found in a chain. They can exist in three different states. They can be in saturated, in monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated. We'll discuss what that means in the next slide. And the other is uh, the triglyceride. Triglyceride is how we store these in our body, so our adipose tissue um, and even our muscle actually has um, stores of, um, of fat which are contained in triglycerides. These are um, three fatty acids bound to a glycerol backbone in order to create this triglyceride. So as you can imagine, when we're taking triglycerides, if we compare uh, uh, glycogen versus triglycerides are two storage forms of these molecules for energy production. In our glycogen, we can break uh, glucose off, glycogenolysis. We just cleave one glucose off of glycogen. Again, a relatively quick process. Here in triglycerides, we actually have to break um, the fatty acids uh, down, break them off the, the glycerol molecule. Then we have to break that uh, then each fatty acid down multiple steps, and you can see why this is going to take longer and be a slower rate of production of ATP. So if we look specifically at uh, fatty acids here, we have, again, three different kinds. The saturated contains the max number of hydrogen bonds with no double bonds, whereas an unsaturated fatty acid um, does not contain a max number and has at least one hydrogen bond. Uh, and then we can break down this unsaturated fat even more by mono versus poly. Mono meaning one, at least one double bond, and poly meaning more. Um, both of these are found in plant-based foods, and the idea that they may have um, health benefits uh, is, is more in the nutrition side of things. So if we then look at the storage form, triglycerides, again, three fatty acids, glycerol, we break these down by a process called lipolysis. We cannot use glycerol in order to um, make energy. However, uh, there are metabolic pathways to synthesize glycerol into glucose at the liver. Or for the most part, this isn't going to provide a, uh, a lot of energy, uh, but it can be done. So again, here's our glycerol. It's our glycerol backbone. One, two, three fatty acids. And then we can break them into um, a... Um, just three fatty acids removing the bond with the glycerol uh, uh, by lipolysis. And the last is proteins. Uh, proteins provide us with one gram of uh, four kilocalories per one gram of protein. Uh, it is composed of subunits called amino acids. Uh, there are 20 amino acids. 11 of them are non-essential and nine essential essential meaning we have to get them from our diet. Uh, um, proteins are, uh, or amino acids are the building blocks for all proteins that, that we consume, and when we eat them, most of the, the food that we have is gonna have a large portion of each of these. Uh, they can produce energy in a couple ways. Uh, one specific amino acid, acid, alanine, can be converted into glucose, 
and stored as glycogen if we need in the liver. And then we can break that glycogen down uh, and, and use it as energy. There's also a, a handful of amino acids that can be converted into metabolic intermediates, which can be useful in um, muscle bioenergetic um, pathways. So those two sentences are a long way in saying that proteins aren't really used to provide energy, uh, aren't uh, readily available, take lots of metabolic processes in order to convert them from one thing into another. And so since that takes time uh, and also takes away from our amino acid pool, they are used very, very little in, um, in energy production at both rest and exercise. One of the few times that protein is going to become an important fuel source is, of course, if you limit the amounts of, um, of other fuels that you're giving. So if you are eating a very low carbohydrate diet, you may start to rely a little bit more on protein for that energy source. So that sums it up for this. In the next, we'll uh, hit on enzymes.